that's I guess we started, huh? All right. Well, the, thanks for joining, everybody. This is today is uh, April 18th, and you can tell I might be squinting a little bit because I'm trying to do this without my glasses. It's somehow late, lately I've been able to see better without them. I get these glasses, these $1 Ooh. things from the dollar store. They just work great. I keep one everywhere. Is that they what you great. wear? You wear readers? Yeah. yeah they I'm going to go back my... to that. I, yeah, I went back to get, uh, you know, prescription glasses a, mm -hmm. a few years ago, and they're horrible. Mm -hmm. They were horrible. And you have so, to keep changing them. Maybe, and yeah, there's that too. So I think they're destroying your vision. But anyways. Yes. But thanks for joining everybody. Uh, today, I just uh, this is John Jay. And I have with me a member of my team, team leader really is Moko. And I have to say, give her some accolades because she, for the last three years or more, she's been instrumental in making things work. And we took on this phony pandemic and worked with a lot of people. And I think we helped a lot of people. Yeah. I think the best we could do on the cases was bring the whole issue canned perfectly to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And the Supreme Court doesn't want to talk about it. Yeah. So that's the best we can do. Right, yeah. Brian? <laughs> Brian, Brian yeah. had one of the petitions. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. along that way, and I don't know if you mind, you tell me to stop if you want me to, Moko, but she she took on this work uh, just without any background. I'm going to tell you, she was a sommelier, <laughs> you know, the person that you go to a nice restaurant, right? And she's the one that comes to your table and tells you what goes with your meal, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's a delight to have her visit because we take her to the wine store and she could sh tell us what's good, you know? <laughs> but anyways, uh, she picked up this stuff and she put it, made a full-time job out of it and just has been a leader in the whole thing. And so I just want to say thank you for the, all these years. And here she is. And we're getting into some other um, projects uh, to deal with very important things. And I want to cover those tonight. It seems like the most popular thing that we talk about and the platforms I'm working with are, are like this. So I had a video membership. I still have it. It's privacyfight.io. That is moving over to aceofcoins.club. I have a new partner and we have a new kind of agenda or idea there. So privacy fight will eventually disappear. We want to make sure that the people that are subscribers are still getting access to all their content. Just realize that much of that content is moved over. It's not new content. So we're preserving your membership so that you're not paying more for the same content. And I'm adding a bunch more content. And you'll see, as we're talking about tonight, there's a lot more content. So that's going on. And then that's aceofcoins.club. <clears throat> so aceofcoins.club will eventually replace privacyfight.io. Everyone's sus subscriptions will be preserved. And then aceofcoins.com is still there for now. That leads me into one-on-one -on -one consultations with people. I still feel the need to do that. And I, I believe I'll be doing that in the near future. I'll continue doing that. I enjoy th those things and I enjoy these calls. So the summary of uh, what I want to introduce tonight is hopefully there's a lot of new people here. Um, so what I what I focus on, I'm an entrepreneur. Um, I also, some of the work I do involves the practice of law. I'm not afraid of that. Um, I'm not, I didn't go to law school. I'm not a bar member. I don't care. So if I'm competent to do something, I'm going to do it. If I'm not, I will tell you and I will not do it. <laughs> So, so far, people have not had problems. I've solved their problems and uh, this sort of thing. Solved them and not created new ones. So um, what I focus on is, is property rights. That sounds pretty ambiguous. So for years, it was on debt collections. And it kind of morphed into other things. And lately, what I'm looking at is this new, new technology that's collecting our identifying information, our biometric data. You're seeing it more and more, and it's pervasive. It's everywhere. And so I'm thinking, well, you're not going to avoid it. Even if you prevailed over some of these companies like Target was just sued the other day for collecting biometric data. You know why? Because they just didn't put a notice up. whoop de do Now they put a notice up. whoop de do Okay, somebody got a big fat check. Okay, guys, wake up. This data is being taken from you and it's your private property. So my recommendation is my maybe solution or way to treat this is to make a claim on the property with a security agreement. It's the same thing you would do with a software license. You all are familiar with this, right? Download the app. You're asking permission to use somebody's intellectual property under license terms. You're using it every day, but you're giving your property away for free. Why? Put a lien on it. It's property. Put a lien on it in which you can foreclose your interest later if you want. I don't care about that. What I'm thinking is on a bigger scale, this isn't leads me into the other aspect of what I'm talking about. I like to work with people and solve problems. I'm not trying to sell paper to people, okay? I wanna solve big systemic problems. So if we work together and we 
we share and teach each other how to do these things. We put liens on your biometric data, right? And if there's enough people with liens, security agreements, why couldn't we pool them together in a corporation and raise funding? It's a heck of an asset. I mean, each mm -hmm. lien probably could be worth maybe, let's say, a few hundred dollars, let's just say. Maybe some of them are worth thousands of dollars. I don't know. Well, what if we had, you know, 100,000 of them? What kind of money can we raise for that? Imagine a company that owns all the intellectual property rights of, let's say, the rock band Journey from the 80s, just hypothetically, right? What would that be worth? A big aspect of its net worth, right? So that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a big picture here. I'm just giving you the means the te technical aspect of it, the, the procedure to go ahead and express a, a right that you have and claim the right. Mm -hmm. I'm showing you how to do that. And so going back to the debt collection aspect of it, okay, property rights, my right to have wages that can't be subject to levy. And yeah, maybe I didn't pay my credit card bill, but if I can make myself uncollectible, then at least it gives me the power to decide if I'm going to pay it. They don't get to levy my paycheck, right? Because I learned how to do a couple of tricks. And that's what I teach people. I teach them that, the consumer debt. We get into the foreclosure thing, right? We can talk about that. But biometric data is also putting a lien on your data that it's going to be collected anyways. Um, then when it comes to like the secured debts, like foreclosures, it, half the country is a, a quick, uh, what do you call it? Um, a trustee state. That means they just pu publish a notice about the sale of your property and then sell your property in two months or three months. Then half the, half the country is judicial foreclosure. That means you have to get sued and they have to prove the case and all this sort of thing. So there's a remedy there. And uh, for many years, I published that and I took cases one-on-one, -on -one, one by one, thousands of them. Uh, dealing with, with foreclosure. And so what I decided was that I, I realized that they're always going to take your house. I mean, you can delay it for years if you want, but they're going to take your house. So my goal was always to get the client's money back, which I did. And then I showed them how to do the next thing, buy another house with bad credit. So that was doable. But back then I wasn't using easements. Now what I'm suggesting is that if your title, the title of your home is being foreclosed upon is threatened in any way or property taxes, mortgage, uh, permitting violations, okay, code violations, all these things, you can actually establish an easement that transfers your title rights over to the easement, preserves them, even though your title rights will be stripped away from you and the possession you individually would have would be stripped away, it's conveyed over to an easement that can reestablish them. Now, you just can't walk into the court and do this. They don't like it. It's legal. So what we have to do is avoid the trial court, which is what I'm going to talk about now. And I don't think I mentioned this before. I'm introducing something to you, which I'm calling the ad hoc jury. It's an arbitration forum, just like the American Arbitration Association, just like the National Arbitration Forum. It's a, it's a what I call a jury because people have the judicial power. They still do. We just gave mm -hmm. it to our court system and they're the agents. Okay. We're still the principals. We still have the judicial authority. We decide what the law is. Okay. I'll give an example of this. I mentioned this a while back. Um, every fr last Friday of every uh, month here in Winter Park in uh, in Orlando, uh, about 600 to maybe 1,200 people get together, and we all ride our bikes for an hour, hour and a half downtown Friday evening in rush hour, and we decide what the traffic patterns are, and the cops stand back and let us do it because they have no choice. Because when enough pedestrians, and that's what we are are on the, in the street and we're not obstructing the street. We're using the street. Everybody has to stop. The cars have to stop. They cannot cross our path. So as we're approaching a light, let's say it's a green light. The rule is we go through the green light. And as it turns red, there's so many people, it takes like a few cycles to pass. Everybody just keeps going and everybody understands this. The cops watch us. They can't, they can't do anything. They're not supposed to do anything. All right. If we approach a light that's red, we stop. It works both ways. So my, my point in mentioning this is that we are the law. So I created the ad hoc jury so that people have access to an arbitration procedure to establish rights in property without relying upon the corrupt trial court system. We have every legal right to do it. Why the heck have we not been doing it? It's been used against us for decades. And I could tell you stories about that. That's another call probably, but uh, let's use it against these uh, creatures that want to take our rights. And so don't complain about it. Don't complain about how, uh, you know, uh, your, your rights are being stolen every day. Do something about it. Take them back. Mm -hmm. The law is available to everyone. And yeah, there are gatekeepers and they're trying to prevent us from accessing the law. Don't let them. 
get around them. Just like the idiots that were trying to stop people from recording the biometric security agreement, right? We went around them one way or another. There's all kinds of ways to go around them. All right, so what? So this whole idea on using easements is also a method uh, that we're starting to use where uh, we see the counties involved in a land grab in, in one way or another. There's versions of this. Um, not to get into all that, but <clears throat> with establishing an easement, I believe you have retained control over the possession of the property. And because of the way I have this set up, if you look at my arbitration clause, those of you who have these easements, you look at the arbitration clause, understand that I've created a whole court system. Mm -hmm. It's outside your trial court system. And I know you already paid for the trial court system, but it's gone. It was stolen from you. You don't have it anymore. It was stolen. So we need to go back to the people that have the judicial authority and the power and the knowledge and the right, the principle, and set up our own arbitration panels. Now, here's the irony. This is why it works. You go to the arbitration program. Okay. I created it just like the American Arbitration Association. It's very similar. Okay. It's, it's arbitration standards, commercial arbitration standards that are used around the world, just like the UCC. This is nothing new. It's not John Jay's idea. Okay. I'm just putting it together for you. Now, once we go through a process, you know, and use an arbitration provision in my security agreement or the easements or the post-nuptial agreement, those things, okay, uh, we can actually go to the court, that corrupt court we were trying to avoid. We had already avoided them, right, with the arbitration award. We go to the court and get a, what's called a confirmation of the award. The judge cannot uh, investigate the merits of the cause. He just simply has to award a final judgment that then gives you access to the police and the executive authority to go and seize property. And we just totally bypass the trial court system. Does yeah. that solve a lot of problems? It sure will. This is what we have to do. Mm -hmm. All right. So and this is the big one here. Okay. So of course we talk about cryptographic currency and gold and whatever things to sell. Okay. What you call investments, uh, stocks and all this stuff, real estate, securities, receivables, business ownership, okay, staking, all these things, property that you own, some of which produces cash flow, uh, things you can sell for dollars. If we manage those things through a limited liability company and we use the LLC as a pass-through, we have a different way to exercise our property rights that's not subject to a tax. Now, I've explained this many, many times before, but the way in which I use it legally avoids the tax. No trick. Okay, and I write these so that it's the, the assumption is that the iris is looking over my shoulder every moment. When I do something for a client, I assume that at some point in the future, someone's going to analyze all these things that I did, the cash flow, the bank account, the manner in which I'm having the client use the LLC, and they're just going to say, okay, fine. Now, I've been doing that for almost 30 years like that because I didn't learn in the first few years. I had to figure that out. So I'd say I've been doing this for over 30 years, so probably 25 years, let's say. I've been doing it that way always passed the test. Never had a problem. I'm not in the IRS's face. I don't have a problem with the IRS. I go to audits and you know they know me. I sign powers of attorney. I don't have a problem with the IRS. So anyways, that has, I, I believe this uh, whole idea of using the easements is going to be quite effective, just like uh, all these other methods. Uh, now, Getting it, I'm, this is another thing that's very important. Okay, so and, and after this, I would just like to open up for for Q and A questions and answers. And uh, what's what I'm finding is that you guys should be just outraged over this and shocked and astounded that your family court is has nothing to do with your family. Because first of all, the the first duty of the court of any court is to preserve the status quo. So mm -hmm. when you come in there for you ask the court, you petition for the dissolution of a marriage. The court's duty is to determine if the marriage can be resolved or not. And if not, its duty is to declare the dissolution of a marriage. Mm -hmm. This type of jurisdiction is known as equitable relief or declaratory judgment to declare something, to say that something should happen or should not happen. That's it. It's not to decide child custody. It's not to decide who's going to pay who what. It's not mm -hmm. going to decide who's going to live somewhere. Okay. The state has no authority to get into those matters. Now, if I'm not talking about cases where there's abuse or neglect, so but it's important to understand what I just said and two more things. The next thing is this court is dealing with property rights. It's obvious for us to understand, okay, money is property, right? Car ownership, property right. Right to sell a house, it's a property right. Mm -hmm. Your house is property. Your right to sell it is a property right. It's intangible. 
It's not like the right of McDonald's to sell its stock on the stock exchange. That's a public, even though it's a private company, it's still a public concern. And so the government has to regulate that, right? But your right to sell your house or buy a house or live in your house is a private property right. So is a parental right. The right to choose mm. how you're going to care for your children and how your custody is going to be arranged during and after a marriage. Even if you're not married, okay? Having children in, in has uh, certain property rights dealing with the parental relationship, okay? The parental association. These are property rights. Now, it's so important that you understand this. So the other part of what I'm telling you is that because of these intangible property rights, you should see them as money. So if you have cash in the bank, mm -hmm. that's the same as your right as a parent to tell your child to do something or to decide what, how you're going to feed your child, okay? This is a property right. Now, the court sees it that way. It doesn't tell you that. It doesn't, the lawyers don't even understand this really, I don't think. So what the court is doing is it's reallocating property rights in the family and disrupting and destroying the status quo. And I believe the agenda is to destroy the family's ability to build and preserve wealth. Mm -hmm. So imagine if you're, most families would, you know, they're, they're doing the, the responsible thing, right? They get married, they have children. I'm not saying not doing that is not responsible. I'm just saying, you know, the stereotypical family is you have children, you have a house, you buy a house, then you make the payments on it for a while. And then the equity goes up, right? And then you sell it and you get some cash left over and then you go buy another house on credit and you sell some cash left over, right? And so for many people, they'll take that cash and, and start a business at age 50, right? Or age 40. <clears throat> the system doesn't want you to do that. It wants you to not to have that equity, okay? So with a 50% divorce rate, what happens to your promissory notes on the, with the bank on the mortgage? If you have an interest rate of 5%, and your note is seven years old or 20 years old, and you have to sell your house because the judge said so, you think you have to anyway, so we'll get to that in a mm -hmm. second. What does that do for the banks? That explodes their internal rate of return. So if the banks, the face value of the note is five, 6% that you thought was a great interest rate, which it probably is, and then you, you refinance before the 30 years, the bank the the five percent the bank's making at face value on the note, uh uh, it's making like a hundred twenty seven percent, fellas. Yeah. They're stealing your money. Yes. You don't understand the the underpinnings of this whole mm -hmm. fraudulent system, this feudal system. Okay, you should be really outraged and angry, outraged. Okay, so understanding this thing, what I just said on property rights and how the system is benefiting from the divorce and how the court has a duty to preserve the status quo and it's limited to its jurisdiction is limited to equ equitable relief. Hang on a second. Equitable, equitable relief. Equitable relief means you can only declare a thing that can be done or not done. You can't award damages. The court does have jurisdiction to award damages, but here's the thing. There has to be underlying debt. So in a marriage, what's the underlying debt? There isn't one. Why? Because the marriage, the marital community is not a debtor. The marital community is not a debtor. Think about it. The husband and wife have a mortgage, but the marital community, the banks don't loan to husbands and wives as a marital estate. They loan to the husband and or the wife as the individual debtors on the mortgage, okay? There is no marital estate that's the debtor. So in a in a in a divorce proceeding, how is it that the judge is going to start assigning alimony payments? There's no underlying debt. They don't do that in a debt collection. Why is it the first thing they do in a divorce proceeding is discover assets? You don't do that until post-judgment discovery if you win the case, if you're a debt collector. There has to be an underlying debt. Imagine filing a bankruptcy petition when there's no creditors and you have no debts. Let me tell you what's going on in family court. The judge is proceeding under involuntary receivership. You're being liquidated. Go read your statute. It's a bankruptcy proceeding. Involuntary receivership. The judge is acting as the receiver. And he's threatening you with contempt if you don't agree to things, which is the definition of not in agreement. So the marital communities are being pillaged by the court system. And the court is profiting from this and destroying the family's ability to accumulate and build wealth. This is why I want to get into this, and, and Moko is instrumental in this already, and uh, we're, we're now going over the beginning phases of how to deal with these cases. So 
you cannot conduct an involuntary receivership unless somebody asked you to do it. If someone asked you to just to declare a, a, the dissolution of a marriage, you can't run a bankruptcy. You at least have to change the proceeding. You have to change the pleading, the complaint. You have to ask the court for something different. You asked the court for one thing, and now it's doing something else. Okay, so that meets the criteria for summary judgment or judgment on the pleadings. And and we're doing all this, right? So we have the service and uh, Moko's involved and Ray's involved and, and I'm involved and we're all just helping this, helping people with this whole process. And it's scary. And uh, so we have a video series on that called Divorcing the State. We're not trying to, we're not trying to encourage people to get divorced or take an advantage of the other party. What we're trying to do is get the state out of the matter. You guys can do whatever you want. I don't care. You guys work it out because you created the family, you created the relationship. Nobody on the earth has the authority to tell you what to do. Unless you're, you know, abusing somebody or neglecting somebody, all right? Or what you're doing is creating a substantial economic hardship is how it goes. So I just want to just talk about those, uh, those, I, those things, uh, the programs and the video series. You'll see uh, the different uh, video series on these subjects at aceofcoins.club. So divorce in the state is where we actually do casework, right? This is similar to what we did on the phony pandemic. Now we're doing the mostly, uh, the casework we're doing mostly is going to be divorce in the state and also where there's an easement involved and we need to use arbitration. So <clears throat> the service that Mocha and I and, and, and Ray are running has to do with managing easements through going through the arbitration process and also divorce proceedings. And uh, we have certain things we try to do, okay? So like, for example, if it looks like there's a divorce coming your way, what we try to do is head it off by teaching you about arriving at stipulations, managing your money a certain way. All right. So we want to prevent the divorce. We want, in some cases I've had already, I've done these basic things before it went to court and um, both spouses ended up trying to work it out. So some of them are still trying to work it out, but sometimes you just can't. Right. But the whole idea is that we want to get the state out of your business because it was never in your business. Now people talk about, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at this. People talk about, um, uh, marriage licenses creating jurisdiction. That's not what's happening. In a marriage a divorce petition or child custody petition, it has to do with residency. So if you look at any of those petitions, you'll find out the allegations are centered around residency as to jurisdiction, okay, and venue. So residency, it's not, an, there's no allegation that the parties have a marriage license. So just realize that the licensing itself creates residency. Residency is what creates the jurisdiction. So it's where you live essentially. Okay. And then on April 23rd, I know I sent out this. If you look at my chat thing here, the last thing I'll mention uh, is where um, I, I have this arrangement with a company that has pooled together the small Amazon inventory buyer so that he can buy at the rates that the big ones are buying at, right? So I can buy inventory and be just as competitive with Walmart if I want to be thanks to this company. And what, moreover, what's really cool is they charge you a small amount of money for a three-year period of time in which they manage your website. So it's even better than trying to do it yourself. I mean, don't think it's a passive income. Don't think of it's an investment. You throw money at it and close your eyes. You got to get involved, but still you got a company that's letting you use Amazon's trade secrets. Now, Amazon's not going to tell you it's trade secrets. It's going to let you benefit from them. That's different, right? So now you're going to be able to know what products you need to put in inventory and what you're selling. And most of the time, he said, the, the, the client who referred me uh, was making 40% already in three months. He's making 40%. <clears throat> He's already put in $42,000 in this. So I wanted to introduce this to each of you because I talk much about uh, creating cash flow. And of all the times I've introduced this concept, this idea to people to go out and buy a website or something small or do a joint venture and create a few thousand dollars a month, this opportunity is much easier than what I've been describing. It's the same thing. It's just much easier. So with that, um, I'm more than happy to do questions and answers. You always have good questions, everybody. Hit me with something crazy. And, uh, or I'll take, a, I'll take my weekend now. And Mocha will be happy to answer all your questions. She just has to unmute herself. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I'm shivering away. Okay. Well, you know, it's funny. Karen Kay was saying that she had a, a, an arbitration experience, and she says she lost the case, but it was a good experience. And I was just wondering, you know, what the deal was there. The arbitration is very useful. I think uh, many times it's used to uh, uh, exploit consumers. I've seen it being used for that. 
Um, we had a period of time where we were able to shut that down, uh, but I've seen it's quite useful. Um, I also like mediation. I mean, I think if you get someone who actually understands the law, it's his profession. I hate to say an attorney, but an attorney can be quite helpful if you put him in a position of being the mediator mm -hmm. and the parties actually are really trying to work something out and someone's not trying to exploit somebody. Like I think the banks putting an arbitration clause in the contracts is unfair because the bank spent many, many years writing that contract. And then you come along and want to use the services and they say, yeah, well, you have to waive your rights to go to court. How is that fair? Mm -hmm. If you don't like it, then you'll never be able to use a type of service like that. This is mm -hmm. because they monopolize the type of terms. Mm -hmm. So that's not fair. But yeah, there's all kinds of good ones. All right. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have someone's give me a, okay. All right. So uh, somebody has a question. No comply. What did you want to, or a statement? What is it you want to? Well, throw at? I'm just driving in, in my wife's Tesla right now, and I used to have this autopilot. You know, you, you steer and stay in your lane for you, and they also have a cabin camera. Yeah, right. And They're watching everybody. They're collecting everybody's data. There's a sliding, little sliding uh, thing to cover with the cabin cam. So I kept it covered because I don't want them to see. You know, kind of like on laptops, have that little slider to yeah. shut it off. Yep. All of a sudden, the autopilot's not working. I'm like, wonder what's up with that. So then I look on the screen. It says, uh, "Your your cabin cam is is, is uh, closed or blocked." Ha! Yeah, because they yeah. want to collect all your data. They're collecting so much data, you it's beyond your comprehension. If I were to tell you, you would think I'm crazy. You can't you can't imagine how much data is being collected just from like a one minute, one second segment of this video of me. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah, and so so um, Tesla is collecting data from everybody around in the traffic while it's ruining the environment. Not only in the manufacture of Tesla, but in the what it's doing to the magnetic field and to your body when you're next to it. It's crazy. It's destroying everything. Okay. Well, it's, it's even, a nuisance, but yeah, it's even more so because I've been messing with the camera. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Tell, like, them, uh, okay. tell them to turn it off. You don't want to be under surveillance. Tell them, see what they do. Because really, yeah. I think I think that the car itself is it's paying for itself by the data. It's, I think that's how bad it is. In fact, I think you can get the Tesla without any money, and it would still be making a profit for the manufacturer. Well, it's got a, uh, you know, so I, I took a wrist weight and put, you know, they want you to give pressure on the steering wheel. So I yeah. put a wrist weight there so it would give pressure, you know. Um, but when I tell you, I was purposely like making like I was turning my head and holding my hands up in the air so that the camera would catch me. And it's 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 monitoring me, monitoring how I drive. It's policing me already. Of course it is. And and that's being used as evidence. It's compiling evidence against you. The police will have a quick way to get the data from Tesla. That's what they do. They'll use it against you in a trial. If you injure somebody or you're in a car wreck, it will be used against you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you for that comment. Well, yeah. you helped me. I got a couple other things. You helped me with my contract before about putting an arbitration clause in there. Okay. Do you think we can change it to put put it with a, a you know, a John Singleton style arbitration? Yeah. We'll put in the new so, version that I'm using right now. I think you'll like it. We can go over it one day. It, I think it's got, I think it's very useful to people. But yeah, let's do that. Well, I'd like okay. to teach that too. It'll be in my videos. Yeah. Okay. And then, then, so I can put that in my contract. We have to go to such and such arbitration, which is, you know, a, um, the service you set up with people. Who, you know, and you don't need my service, uh, by the way. You, you just need the procedure. So. Yeah, the procedure, anyways. but whatever, you know, the, this this specific procedure you start off with. Um, the other thing is, you keep talking about banks switch to 150 percent rate of return, or their rate of return goes up. Is that why when you pay a mortgage? In the beginning, you pay almost all interest and very little principal. No, that's just the nature of the contract. But the time value of money factors in when you paid off early in any way. If it's foreclosed upon or refinanced or you know sold and someone else pays it off, if it gets paid off early, the internal rate of return skyrockets. For the bank. Yeah, and that's all that really matters to the bank is the internal rate of return. You guys can look this up if you want. Internal rate of return. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I got to see the map on that. But anyway. Um, yeah, there is math on that, by the way, but you can, there's software that gives it to you. So don't worry about that. Okay. okay. All right. All right. That's Thanks for those. All right. Thank you. Um, I just, I'll get to Eric in a second, but, um, Eric's phone one second, uh, a novice. So someone's asking, can a novice mm -hmm. like me do this? Uh, I guess this Amazon thing realistically, well, 
I would say a novice probably doesn't have a chance. So how do you not be a novice? You start. So you have to become not a novice. You have to start it. Does that help? <laughs> you have to start. I mean, what, before I did this work, you guys will just, this ruins my, if I have any credibility at all, it's gone when I tell you this. I was a landscaper. What the heck qualifies me to tell you guys what to do with your money? I was poor. What the heck? Well, I learned, okay? I learned very carefully because <laughs> it's important. I, I tell people the right thing. Um, and then, so Chase announced it's going to sell customer data. Duh. It's already been doing that. Put a lien on it. Make Chase the debtor. That's the t-shirt. You should put yeah. a lien on it. <laughs> put a lien on it. <laughs> should have put a lien on it. Yeah, so... Uh, Anyways, uh, I don't want to get too far on all this, but you guys have some pretty good comments here. I, I don't know if you want the the comments because I, I get the video and I sometimes I put them on YouTube and whatever, but I, I, it gives me a comments file. But, all right, Eric, what did you have? To, what did you want to ask? So, yeah, <clears throat> regarding the, there's a couple of things I wanted to see. So we wanted to sell a property, uh, but before we sell it, we want to do the quit, quit claim and put it under an LLC the, under my wife and I. The, yeah. Right now it's our, both the names and, and I was wondering, could we use the same LLC if we for the Amazon business you want us to? Sure. Uh, yeah, it's very liquid. And it's a one-time deal. Sure. You can handle so we do uh, all the business in that yeah. inside it of the is. same LLC. Correct. Okay. It's it's the so, same identical interest. That's also a nice way to do it. If the, if the interests are the same, then great. If you had a partner involved with your Amazon business, then I probably wouldn't do it that way. Okay. Well, that well, okay. That was the next thing. Is uh, so at some point I saw. I mean, I've been watching your LLC videos about PMAs and all that. Uh, and it seems like it's similar to having a multi-member LLC in terms of the ability to avoid, um, I guess, the, the, liability. The multi-member is ideal, okay, for separating property rights in the title of the LLC outside of your state. If husband and wife own the LLC, it's not out of your state. It's in. Okay, so well, so you, you got to add, add somebody, else. somebody to the Right, you afterward. can add an, an adult child, like one of your children or one of your parents. You can add one of them, and it doesn't create a liability for either of them. So yeah. if you okay. add, well, if so many for whatever reason, yeah, I've, I've, I've asked, I don't have no kids and parents are dead, but <laughs> so we asked a, bro, a sibling and he was like, nah, I don't want any, my name on anything. You know, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, fear, fear and fear. And this uh, is know, the what, benefit of knowing people and working with people. I mean, I don't like to do that for clients because I can't, I'll be tied up with, you know, 10,000 clients right. and that's not fair to them. So find somebody and, and you'll, you'll find somebody. So if, if you don't find it, is it, I remember you mentioning like a trust to be similar type of thing, but it's. Well, the thing is it, you can do a trust, but the beneficial interests are still there. There's no new people involved. It's just you and your wife. So there's okay. gotta be something. You gotta have another so, person. Oh, I see. Just adding another person. Okay. There has to be a different interest besides you and, or your wife to make right. it, to get charging order. Now you'll, you'll be just fine. If you, you both own the corporate company and you do the sale and it, it works through, it's just that you're not separating your personal liability from other things and the, and the company or your LLC interest. So you would know months in advance if there was going to be a claim on it. Like you would know a long time if the IRS is going to do something, someone's going to sue you. So you're okay. Just realize the remedy is don't be the only owners. You need one more, one more right. person. So it's okay to just go through everything as our, as using our, our names uh, initially. Yeah. And then eventually fine. add an, a third, add another member. And, that would and that be the, work. yeah, that would be the ideal thing to do. I'll tell you just and a quick people. story. Okay. I, just uh, uh, here's how I've done things. So uh, when we had all those horrible hurricanes in 2004 or something in Pensacola and throughout, it was like seven hurricanes. It just destroyed a whole bunch of cities. So I, I was driving all over the state. We would go over here, wait out the hurricane. Then we'd go over here, wait out the hurricane. When I came back to Pensacola, it was wrecked and the whole, the whole town was a wreck. And so I thought, what the heck, my house is still good. So I'll, I'll just go to the United way and I'll just go see what they need. I go over there to volunteer and what they were doing is say, here's a chainsaw, go cut out some trees from people's driveways, you know? So we were doing stuff like that. Well, when I did that, I met this gentleman over there who was investing in real estate. He had just come from California. And so he and I have since become really good friends. And I just did that by just going out to just work with people, you know? And so maybe you need to expand your network of people that you know by doing things like that. Just just get into some activity, you know, uh, some club or something. There's, I see over here in Orlando, there's um, 10, 20 people riding their bikes, like 15, 20 miles an hour every Saturday morning, you know, like madmen. 
you know, clubs like that, you know, there's people that you could just be friends with that probably have a similar interest. They probably want to work with you. Man, right. Or other investors like with Georgia Real Estate Investors Association, Georgia Real, those guys over there, they understand all that stuff. They understand LLCs. So yeah, just open up your, you know, connections. That's really important. With, from what's coming, you're going to need to know people. Yeah, we know people. Just a lot of people mm -hmm. have fear of being on a radar of some sort. And Everybody's think, on the radar. They, get they over think it. that somehow they're going to be added to our radar and be so tell them too late. Reliable. You're already on it. Hey, Lou, <laughs> if you if you want to just show somebody how foolish that thinking is, take them. Tell them to go look at Intellius and search on their names. Intellius.com. Tell them go go to Intellius.com and search on your name, or go to just Google.com and search on your name, and tell me how you defeat that. Because you can't. Right. So then they should get over their fear right now. Okay, and one <laughs> other thing, quick uh, on an LLC uh, address. I noticed you said uh, you should. It's better to have it out of, out of your home state. Uh, is there some reason not to like use our personal address? As no, the you can LLC use your. Yeah, that's all fine. It's just um, I like setting up companies in states that are friendly to my clients. So if, if you're in an unfriendly state, that's the reason why I'd say go to another state. Okay. So yeah. is Florida is friendly Florida's state? Great. Yeah, it <laughs> okay. is. All Florida, right. New Mexico, Colorado, Arizona, Wyoming. A lot of states are Utah, Montana. Those are friendly states. The unfriendly ones are the ones you should know about. Like they don't leave you alone. They, the state just messes with you. Kentucky, Tennessee, Texas, Illinois, California. Probably those five. Okay. New York. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Crypto Dave, what do you got? Hello. Sorry about the delay. Just had to unmute. Um, let's see here. So um, I'm uh, moving to another area of the United States, and I see this as an opportunity to kind of uh, level up my privacy, um, you know, with a new address and everything like that. And just thought I would ask about some some pointers okay. on that. So mail that you'd like to get that you need to get your grandma's birthday card and uh, what else? Bills. <laughs> So those you want to contact the companies individually and maybe have a form letter or a postcard and just give them your new uh, mailing address. And at the new location where you're going to, maybe consider not receiving mail at your residential actual place where you live or mm -hmm. yeah. receiving mail in a fictitious name. Either mm -hmm. way. Okay. Now, mail that you don't want. Okay. Once you transfer the mail the hard way, contacting each sender and telling them your new address, um, for all the mail that you don't want, it's still going to be sent to your other address, right? That's when you file a change yep. of address notification with the postal service and send them to La La Land in Pennsylvania in an apartment complex okay. without an apartment number. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and some people, I mean, I've done this for some people, like the one gentleman kept getting notices from the IRS, but he was already uncollectible. It didn't do him any good to talk to the IRS. They weren't going to do anything about anything. And so the only problem he had was his wife kept reading the mail and then nagging him about it. So I said, well, why don't you just change your address with the IRS and be done with it? You won't get any more mail. It's problem solved. And that's mm -hmm. what he did. Yeah. Yeah. Just pick some random address. You're pick saying a, kind of, an apar yeah. apartment complex. Or apartment with complex. Unit, and then yeah. don't put it in an, an apartment number. And it doesn't hurt anybody because they get mail like that all the time. They just chuck it in the trash. Awesome. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And uh, and then the next step, I know there's different layers to this, of course. There's kind of the easier ones that you just mentioned. And then um, a creating an alias, uh, you know, would be a next level probably, right? Okay, so a fictitious name, sure. And I always do that. So yep. if I get a PO box um, on the 1583 on, I think, box uh, 14 that asks you for a trade name, if I'm using an LLC, I don't use the LLC designation on that. I just give it a trade name. So the trade name is the LLC name without the LLC on there. So that's how I do it. So you can do anything you want. You can have a company name on there. You can have an, a fictitious name like Mr. Brown. The post office will help you do a trade name. And you could probably do several. In fact, I've noticed over the years, uh, the post office will box my mail, even if it's in a name I never used before and I didn't tell them I was going to use it. And then after a while, sometimes they'll ask me about it and then I'll add it to the list. So it's not a big deal. That's that's one way to use an uh, an alias and the mail is pretty much the easiest. If you want to do it with the bank, like your bank account, John Smith is your name, right? So you want to have like, let's say you want to have an alias of the name Mary. So you would just ask the bank, hey, I want to use a fictitious name on this account. How would you be able to recognize payments to Mary? And the bank will tell you. Oh, 
Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yep. Yeah. There are other other things too, but basically those are some basic tenets of doing that. If I is, receive important things or valuable things in my house for convenience, I just don't send it in my name. I, I, mm -hmm. I yeah. maybe purchase it in my name, but I have it delivered as a gift to you know Bill Smith or something, right? Awesome. Yeah. 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 yeah and I see someone yeah. mentioning get virtual mail. Yeah, sure. I mean, you could do that too. There's remailing. Sometimes you want to make it look like you you live somewhere else. And I've done that before. If you don't know someone in another state, like like I had to remail something one time. And so I just wrote the letter, put the envelope and put the stamp on there. And then I put all that into another envelope and sent it to my Uncle Bob. And I said, hey, Uncle Bob, when you get this thing, just open the mail and drop the envelope that's in there, drop it in the mail. Mm -hmm. so that way it looks like it came from Uncle Bob's neighborhood and not my neighborhood, right? Very simple yeah. remailing. You can do that for free. There are services that will do it for a dollar for you. Oh. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's interesting. Yeah. All right. Um, and, yeah. And a follow up to that um, really quick. Uh, you had mentioned you were looking for folks to participate um, as arb arbitrators in disputes over easements and receiverships. Is that still open for it folks is. to join? It is just use the contact info and we'll let you know what's what's going on there. It's not illegal. It's not some sort of scheme. Uh, yeah. I've done it before over the years. It's just okay. getting some people to make a decision. And I just would keep this in mind. If you're going to do it, don't try and make me happy. Make a ruling based on your conscience. Okay. Based upon the law. It doesn't matter what I think. It has yeah. To be that I, way. I mean, yeah. for me, it sounds like a good opportunity to learn, yeah. Yeah. Um, to, to jump in and learn course. something new and, 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 and get show you experience. how to do it. Yeah, show you how yeah. to do it. Maybe you might want to mm -hmm. do that whole thing for your neighborhood. You know, there's all kinds yeah. of things to do. Yeah. Okay, great. I'd love to hear more about it. So I'll, all I'll right, um, reach out I'll to the email. Okay. All right, sounds Thanks. good. All right, sure. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, let's see, Tennessee, California. Okay, Tennessee is better than California. <laughs> you can handle Tennessee. Don't worry about that. Okay, don't think all is lost. <laughs> all right. So then uh, let's see, Annie, what did you have? I had, had to unmute. Um. I don't know if you can uh, answer this or not. I'm just trying to have some, uh, I guess, some prediction. So I've got my easement there, whatever. And uh, they sent, the company sent the notice. And I saw in the full notice, because I didn't see the whole thing until later today, that part of it says uh, three days to vacate, dot, dot, dot. I don't know how realistic. Okay, so if you're using the easement. The, with, okay, you're using an easement where there was a foreclosure. And yeah. you need to go through the arbitration process and establish the easement holder's rights. And the easement holder can then do the same thing that the title holder is doing. And the title holder doesn't have the rights that the easement holder does. The, the okay. title holder doesn't understand yet that it is uh, in, interfering with the easement. So you need to just go through the whole process, okay? Go through the arbitration. And she has a notice okay. of interference out, right? Yeah, Can there's a the notice of interference that that, mm -hmm. that uh, certified yeah. they received it. It's been over seven days, and, and also, then they just yeah okay, yeah they ignored it. The, the other thing is that um, from I, from what I understand, from what I remember, uh, they're not able to get the title perfected, so they have a problem with standing in the courts. I think, I don't know how they would overcome that. So with their little notice, that's like three days, blah blah blah, you know to vacate basically it says it, it, it's like two, it's like three pages when i saw it today in full um how realistic is it that all right what just they would... go through the arbitration process i'm not going to speculate okay. on it all right yeah Kat, i'm just saying you... i'm in another yeah. state that's all yeah yeah all right cat what do you got what question do you have hey john um so i'm going to be doing coaching and i'm looking at also creating an llc um so I mean, can I can I can I have like my the LLC company name as the one that's doing the coaching? I mean, obviously it's a personal service. Oh yeah, you know, whenever you're be... coaching, sure. When someone sends you money, I mean, either he's going to hand you some cash or he's going to write you a check, right, or ask to take uh, take a credit card. If you're going to take credit cards, make sure that your LLC is the um, merchant processing account holder. If if he's going to write you a check, make sure you tell him who to write the check to. That's what I do. If you look at my order form, it says all this marketing stuff on there, but in the small print it says. Um, a payments will be processed by whatever company, Georgia Capital or something like that. So you just do it that way. Okay, so that that ensures the liability protection as well. That is the way to handle the money, and so that you don't have the individual personal tax liability for it. 
Okay. And and of what? course other liabilities too, but you're just doing a professional service. So I don't know. It's not like you're selling something that's going to blow up or no one's going to slip on your floors. Right. You just, it's a professional service and you're not even, right. it's not even a medical service. So you're in pretty right. good shape oh, okay. there. So I don't yeah. have to freak out about it. <laughs> you can, if you want. Yeah. Sounds like fun. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> Okay, let me let me just address this one little thing here, and I'm I'm gonna I'm not gonna go on for a long time here, but this is this caught my attention. So I was so someone wants to schedule a consult, consultation with me, having difficulty with daily daily duties. Okay, so don't we all? We all have our things we have to do, and it's hard to keep track of the things. Yeah, and and so she wants to get involved in the Amazon business, which is ideal. So just realize, yeah, I mean we're all busy doing things, right? Um, I think one of the skills you may have to develop, we all have to develop. I think we have to figure this out. I had to figure it out is how to allocate my time throughout the day. Um, it does help to have an assistant and there are virtual assistants. If you want to think about getting an assistant and I know it does cost money, but I would suggest this to you that even if it costs you a little bit of money to have a virtual assistant to handle some of your duties and menial things that the assistant can do and you don't have to, like maybe answer your own phone for you. Uh, and maybe handle some menial tasks, it's actually paying for itself because you'll free up your time, which is valuable. I would say it's more valuable than the personal assistant because the personal assistant is already, already discounted as labor, right? He's already discounted as labor. You're not. So hire the personal assistant, free up some of your time, and then allocate it. And, and yeah, keep on doing what you're doing, but develop something that starts making money. And of course, with more money, you have more time. You're actually buying time. People live to be what, 72, 82, 92, right? But with more money, you can be more effective and get more things done. So you could effectively live longer. Even if your lifespan is only 90 years, you could effectively live to be 200, right? If you're more productive than most other people, if that's what you want to do. So think about bringing in a personal assistant. Yeah, create something that makes some money. And the nice thing about this Amazon thing is that uh, the, it's being run, the, the website is being managed for you. Now, uh, I would think that you're still going to have to be involved. So my estimation, until I talk to, to, the, to the owner again on the 23rd, I think you're going to end up spending a, maybe a few hours a week to make it work or to make sure it works. Like you're going to make money, right? So then the question is, what, what, uh, how much money am I going to put in on a periodic basis? But anyways, I just want to mention that, Lisa. Uh, I know we're all there, very busy. Consider a personal assistant to temporarily or a, or a virtual assistant. All right. All right. Okay. So thank you all for the questions and uh, I'm going to end the recording for now and look forward to next week. Uh, maybe if you guys want something in particular to, to me to get into, I can talk about the arbitration clause in my contracts and how we yes. have this thing set up. Okay. Let's do that then. Let's plan on next week. Let's talk about why this is going to be so powerful and how it has been powerfully used against us. I'll tell you the history of what I what I, my experience was with this, and this is the reason why I chose it, because it was being used as a weapon by the bankers against the uh, credit card users. And I, when I used it against them, it stopped. That's how powerful it is. It's their own weapon, and I used wow. it against them. So we can use it to get over what the uh, the trial court system is is about. We can, we can get pa past that, I think. All right, y'all. Thanks so much. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you, John. All righty.